Today we have with us some luminaries from the worlds of television, print, electronic and social media who will enlighten us on the role of media and its future. Shobha ma'am, you have been one of the most powerful writers who's been writing for the last 40 years in various arenas, be it newspapers, <laughs> magazines, books, script writing. On a daily basis, you write 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 words. In 2016, you became national news with 160 characters or less on Twitter. You said, Rio Jao, selfies low, Kali Vapisa Jao, what a waste of time, money, and opportunities. Do you think it was right for the media to make your views into news? Was the responsibility lacking? You know what? You cannot have a thin skin and call yourself a media person. If you're expressing an opinion which is in the public domain, you jolly well learn how to take it. You cannot then run for cover and say, oh, but I didn't mean it, or I, unless it's something that's leading to a law and order situation, unless there's going to be blood on the streets, unless it's something that's inciting rioting, or someone's life is being threatened, any other opinion today is power for the course. Every single person can be a citizen journalist and is. Uh, we have platforms like Twitter where you, me, all of us can express an opinion. Now the only difference being, can you handle the heat? If there is flack, how do you respond? And I often say this because it's worth uh, repeating, that if you don't like the heat, as the old cliche goes, stay out of the kitchen. At the time of that particular tweet, which, uh, well, that wasn't the worst tweet of my life. I've had far more responses to other tweets and been trolled and trolled and trolled. Um, <clears throat> as a nation, we are sensitive. Every nation has its own sensitivity points. And uh, I felt very strongly that a country of one billion plus people that we cannot produce world-class athletes until that point we hadn't even gotten uh, a bronze. And we had a huge contingent. My tweet was more about the officials who were with the athletes. And I think there were al almost as many uh, officials along for the ride as there were athletes competing. And they were certainly there to do nothing much more than take their selfies and khali hat vapasao. Uh, but I understood that sentiments of the athletes were hurt, and I was more than happy to say, I apologize if I hurt the sentiments of those competing. As an athlete myself, I know the kind of discipline and hard work that goes into it. So it was not meant at all to give offense, and uh, I tried in my own way to make up for that towards the athlete. Towards those officials, I will repeat it again, that they're just freeloaders. That's great to hear. But do you think often light-hearted humor is considered or made sensationalized? That's okay too. I mean, we live in an era of everything is entertainment. Even this conclave is an entertainment. We are here because we are looking at uh, sound bites, we are looking at optics, we are looking at how many people is it going to reach, how many likes are there going to be, uh, where, which platforms is this going to be on, will it be on YouTube, who's going to put it up on Facebook. Uh, this is today's age, and it is an age which makes all of us performers, whether we like it or not. Everybody becomes an exhibitionist. Uh, and even writers whose job is to write today have to go out there and not just write their books and hope they sell, but go out and actively promote them. And it's part of a circus that is unavoidable. So it's something you have to learn how to manage. Even branding is something you learn how to manage. You learn how to manage your time, your image, everything, and to give yourself the perspective that you are on top of it and not the image and the branding and the pressures on top of you. As long as you can make that distinction, I guess you survive in a way that's uh, at least a little sane. Otherwise, you can get completely swept away and totally distracted. It will only be about how many likes do I have. So in a way, the whole controversy about likes being uh, probably eliminated yes. is going to lessen the stress on far younger people whose entire beings, their identity, their lives are on that little phone or on an iPad and on just making sure 
that their images are being appreciated. Images which have been fixed, photoshopped, all the apps that are available, everybody's life looks gorgeous. <laughs> everybody's life is fantastic and perfect. blissful and perfect. So it is something that we have to know how to cope with without going totally mad. Thank you. Nalin, you're a social science scholar heading the TOI online as the executive director. Your app is number one for English news in India. Often it is said that sensationalizing the news is because it's a game of market share. We saw what Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes did with Fox News in the US. How at TOI are you planning to combat this? Um, so in terms of, you know, you know for, for a long time for online content, for example, there was this idea that you just have clickbait. Uh, you say something outrageous uh, and then get someone to click and it doesn't matter if you have crap inside. I don't think that works anymore at all. Even if you're, I'm keeping aside the morality of it for the moment for this argument for a second. Uh, even for those who look for it commercially, that model doesn't work at all anymore uh, because the audiences I think are far more mature and far more aware than, than, we, than people often give them credit for. Uh, the second thing is that, yes, uh, there, there is, of course, an echo chamber. And when you're talking about Roger Ailes or, or, uh, or Fox News or Rupert Murdoch, of course, there is the uh, left echo chamber and there's a right echo chamber. And, 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 you know, the same kind of things circulate within that. Now, that is different. That is people branding their, their products to appeal to a certain constituency. Uh, and, and, oh, and, and all the readers within that, all those who subscribe to that point of view, it, it reinforcing their viewpoints. That is not something which is uh, restricted alone to digital or to any one platform. In fact, I would argue that this distinction between digital and print and television is absolutely irrelevant now. I mean, for, for, for the average reader, if you see a tweet from the Times of India or a Facebook post or something in print, it's one and the same thing. You don't see that this is coming from a different person who's doing this. It's from the Times of India or from the Hindustan Times or, or any other media platform. So for a very long time, we had this idea that somehow digital, um, even for companies, uh, was somehow adjunct to, to what you do in real life uh, or in offline life. You know, you do these smart things which with this, throw in this jargon, you, you know, you try and you buy some likes and you're done. Uh, I think that might have been okay in an age where there was a digital divide when very few people had access to this. But in the last two or three years after the launch of Geo, uh, we have a revolution on data in this country. More people have access to content than, any, than ever before. You know, our consumption is roughly around 8 GB per month per consumer, which is on par with developed markets. And about one, uh, about roughly about half of India has access to digital platforms. Uh, my point is that you can't fool readers anymore. Uh, what you can do is you can create different pockets of different kinds of viewpoints. That's different. Uh, but you can't make fools of people. You can't, you can't lie. For example, if, if we put out something wrong, which is factually wrong, or, or it's got a perspective which might be improved on Times of India, we know within two minutes. I mean, we, the amount of feedback you get is, I mean, Shobha has been, been an editor. For, I mean, that time when you could be an editor and you knew um, or you had this great wisdom which others didn't have, that time is long gone. Um, it, I think digital makes you really uh, humble because the amount of mistakes, you, I mean, because your audience is in touch with you every second. Yeah, and I'll just oh, take a moment of you. your role so to tell all our audience over here that we have with us uh, Nandani Bhalla, the editor-in-chief of Cosport Water <laughs> Magazine. Welcome to this session. Moving on, Nala and I have one more question for you. For the past seven to 10 years, the amount of time we're spending on our smartphones has increased drastically, while simultaneously our concentration levels have reduced. So do you think summarizing news on platforms such as yours or in shorts is giving the reader or the viewer the complete picture of the news or of the event? By that you mean little snippets? Yes. Um, look, I, I think what's happened is that older business models have got disrupted. Um, clearly what was working in, in other pre-digital domains, the same model doesn't work now. So they're, they're for, the, for a very long time, precisely because 90, 80 to 90, 95% of your readership is on this, on the phone, there was this glib idea that, you know, you produce something which only fits the screen and that's enough. Uh, I think that's too simplistic. Uh, I think all the evidence that we have, I mean, there is a market for that because people like to quickly get, get abreast of, of what's happening. But I think that every time we try serious 
long form writing. Uh, every time you have something important to say, right? if you write gibberish and if you write crap, it doesn't matter whether it's 35 words or whether it's 3,000 words, nobody's going to read it. But if you have a real point of view, which is, which is different, which have a different perspective, different opinion, uh, genuinely a, a different piece of analysis or a new piece of, uh, of information that comes out, you almost every time get, get good readership and, the, form and the, con the length of that is irrelevant in that. Great, talking about conscience, moving to you, Nandini. You're a woman powerhouse, just at the age of 32. You know, you have millions who follow you. You're the editor of Cosmopolitan, one of the most followed fashion magazines of the country. How do you think the reporting of fashion magazines and in particular Cosmopolitan evolved when it especially comes to body shaming, both directly and indirectly? Are you making conscious efforts to make sure that the common man or common woman's narratives are also being spoken out? Of course, yes, constantly. So we all have a rule at like, at, at, at like work that every single issue must be talking about LGBTQIA and talking about body shaming. And I think that, in fact, just taking from what he just, just said, it is really all based on what we are seeing on our own phones, right? There are beautiful curvy girls out, out, out there and try and say anything negative sort of about them. You'll be thrashed, you know? And to me, that is a sign. Magazines, channel, media houses, pick up what people want to say. And we actually feed our own pages basis what, what we can tell people actually want to do. Sabya Saatchi, last, last month, used an absolutely stunning curvy girl. Um, fashion Weeks, Lakme Fashion Week this year, had a curvy girl special show. This would have never happened five, 10, 15 years back, right? Um, New York Fashion Week um, is actually featuring curvy girls, women in their 70s, um, men. I, I just think that there is this huge shift happening currently, and it's great, because this shift talks about sort of diversity, and it talks about sort of acceptability. Magazines such as ours, every month do it constantly. Sister publications, Harper's Bazaar, um, on the current issue has got five girls, models all of them, from being extremely skinny to being curvy, gorgeous. We are talking about colors of the skin. We are talking about mental health. I think that we are all part of this new India, of this new change, where it is cool to be different, where it is cool to be curvy. It is not cool to be calling out people for for like their sort of body types. And there's this huge movement, so it's great. Well, thank you so much. Talking about cool things, Shobha, you've had a lot of tweets other than the Rio ones too, whether it was about the beef ban, whether it was about the Tikkatwala, whether it was about the Indian women's cricket team or Maharashtra being a separate state. Yeah. You said you've developed a thick skin and you know how to deal with it. Yeah. How have you dealt with all of these social trolls over and over again while simultaneously trying and getting your point of view across to your followers and to your readers? At the end of the day, you have to put yourself on the line. Otherwise, there's no point. As someone who has put herself on the line over 45 years, I hope that what I'm trying to say, and I'm saying it with all my conviction, and I'm willing to back it all the way, uh, makes people think they don't have to agree with it and they can disagree violently as they often do to talk about briefly two things that you've touched upon one was when a cluck was lynched for the suspicion or um, it was believed that he had beef in his refrigerator and i was so completely devastated and shattered that people could enter your home and on some kind of a, a suspicion could kill you for the possession of beef or your storage of beef. So my immediate response was extremely spontaneous and it came from the heart. And my tweet said, I have just eaten beef, come and murder me. Now that generated a lot of hostility, volatility, etc. I was prepared for anything. I didn't mean it to be a provocative tweet. It was anguish that made me tweet that. And I will not regret it because I felt it and I said it. Uh, about the other 
the other tweet which led to, uh, well, I took it all the way to the Supreme Court and I did win, was against uh, the right-wing militant parties in Maharashtra who came after me for something completely innocuous. Uh, it was about prime time viewing in theaters, in uh, multiplexes, where they were about, where they insisted that Marathi films should be shown at prime time. My point was very different. Nobody can dictate, these are commercial decisions. You cannot dictate what should be shown at prime time. I would have said the same thing had it not been a Marathi film. I would have said the same thing if someone had suddenly got up and said a Korean film or a Japanese film or a Malayalam film should be shown at prime time. It is a commercial decision that only the theater owners and stakeholders can define. And it was a light-hearted jibe saying, so forget about popcorn folks and switch to vada pao. That was it. To bring 400 people to my doorstep and threaten to kill me, lynch me, uh, blacken my face uh, was, I mean, to me it was absurd. It was laughable. Now, I had a lot of police protection at that time and continued to have it, though I didn't want it for the next two and a half years. And the police at my home kept saying, do you want to, do, please don't go to your balcony, don't go to the window, don't engage with these people. They were disrupting life for my neighbors. It could have led to a violent situation which had nothing to do with innocent people. So I decided to confront them and I, it was a split second decision. I went down and I asked these guys who were shouting these slogans and Murdabad usual stuff and the cops were actually hesitant to even walk with me. I said, if you don't want to do it, it's perfectly all right. I'll go and talk to them because bullies are cowards. You confront them and they back off and they back down, which they did. I asked them, what's problem? Kya hai? So they said, oh, madam, we have a vada pao leke aaye hai. I said, Dijiye. thank you very much. And I tweeted, delicious vada pao. They said, aise, aapko dene ke liye nahi aaye hai. We want to stuff it down your throat. I said, try. <laughs> So, of course, they backed off, and that was it. And they shouted a few more slogans. They were thrown into police vans, and off they went. Of course, they were put up to it. But we have to stand up to bullies, no matter who, no matter where. Otherwise, what are we? What are we? Cowards and nothing. We're the same as them. Well, thank you so much. Yes, that does it. Allow for a round of applause. I want all your views, all three of you. Should fake news have criminal actions to it, should it be criminalized? And if we do, in trying to get the right news through our consumers, will we become another China where the government controls all media? So on fake news, the first, you know, everybody talks about fake news, the first thing to be said about fake news is, that, that there's a huge, that, that everybody's understanding of fake news is very different. So for example, if you take Donald Trump's definition, then whatever you don't agree with is fake news. Right. right? Um, so if you ask people in this room what they think is fake news, somebody thinks something about Congress is fake news, somebody thinks something about BJP is fake news and so on. So the point, now there was a move to ban, uh, uh, to, to uh, act on journalists who were accused of spreading fake news about a year and a half ago. The government wisely withdrew that move.